Hi everyone, this is Glenda Ganzon and welcome to my Human Anatomy and Physiology class. And for today's video, I'm going to discuss the respiratory system. Kick. So when the respiratory system is mentioned, people generally think of breathing. But breathing is only one of the activities of the respiratory system. The body cells need a continuous supply of oxygen for the metabolic processes that are necessary to maintain life. The respiratory system works with the circulatory system to provide oxygen and to remove the waste products of metabolism. It also helps to regulate the pH of the blood. Respiration is the sequence of events that result in the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the body cells. So every three to five seconds, nerve impulses stimulate the breathing process or ventilation, which moves air through a series of passages into and out of the lungs and after this there is an exchange of gases between the lungs and the blood and this is called external respiration the blood transports the gases to and from the tissue cells and the exchange of gases between the blood and the tissue cells is internal respiration and finally the cells utilize the oxygen for their specific activities and this is called the cellular metabolism or cellular respiration and together these activities constitute respiration now let me discuss the mechanics of ventilation so ventilation or breathing is the movement of air through the conducting passages between the atmosphere and the lungs the air moves through the passages because of pressure gradients that are produced by contraction of the diaphragm and thoracic muscles so pulmonary ventilation is commonly referred to as the breathing and it is the process of air flowing into the lungs during inspiration or what we call as inhalation and out of the lungs during expiration or exhalation. So air flows because pressure differences between the atmosphere and the gases inside the lungs and air like uh, other gases flows from a region with a higher pressure to a region with a lower pressure and muscular breathing movements and recoil of elastic tissues create the changes in pressure and that result in ventilation pulmonary ventilation involves three different pressures the first is the atmospheric pressure the second is the intraalveolar pressure or intrapulmonary pressure and the third one is the intra plural pressure so atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the air outside the body intraalveolar pressure is the pressure inside the alveoli of the lungs and intrapleural pressure is the pressure within the pleural cavity and these three pressures are responsible for pulmonary ventilation so inspiration or inhalation is the process of taking air into the lungs and it is active phase of ventilation because it is the result of muscle contraction and during inspiration the diaphragm contracts and the thoracic cavity increases in volume and this decreases in the intraalveolar pressure so that air flows into the lungs inspiration draws air into the lungs and for expiration or exhalation that is the process of letting air out of the lungs during the breathing cycle and during the expiration the relaxation of the diaphragm and elastic recall of tissue decreases uh, the thoracic volume and increases the intraalveolar pressure expiration pushes air out of the lungs under normal condition, the average adult takes 12 to 15 breaths a minute. A breath is one complete respiratory cycle that consists of one inspiration and one expiration. An instrument called 
uh, spirometer is used to measure the volume of air that moves into and out the lungs and the process of taking the measurement is called spirometry. So respiratory or pulmonary volumes are an important aspect of pulmonary function testing because they can provide information about the physical condition of the lungs. Respiratory capacity or pulmonary capacity is the sum of two or more volumes. So factors such as age, sex, body build, and physical conditioning have an influence on lung volumes and capacities. So lungs usually reach their maximum capacity in early adulthood and decline with age after that. The respiratory conducting passages are divided into the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract includes the nose, pharynx, and larynx. And the lower respiratory tract consists of the trachea, bronchial tree, and lungs. And these tracts open to the outside and are lined with mucous membranes. In some region, the membrane has hairs that help but filter the air and other regions may have cilia to propel mucus and there are four components of the conducting passages and they are first the nose and the nasal cavities second the pharynx third the larynx fourth are the bronchi bronchial tree and lungs and i'll be discussing them all in the next few slides so let me introduce to you the nose and the nasal cavities the framework of the nose consists of bone and cartilage. There are two small nasal bones and extensions of the maxillae form the bridge of the nose, which is the bony portion. The remainder of the framework is cartilage and it is the flexible portion, connective tissue and skin cover of the framework. And the air enters the nasal cavity from the outside through the two openings of the nostrils or external nares. The openings from the nasal cavity into the pharynx are the internal nares. So nose hairs at the entrance to the nose trap large inhaled particles. And paranasal sinuses are the air-filled cavities in the frontal maxillae ethmoid and sphenoid bones and this sinuses which have the same names as the bones in which they are located surround the nasal cavity and open into it and they function to reduce the weight of the skull and to produce mucus and to influence voice quality by acting as resonating chambers the pharynx, commonly called the throat, is a passageway that extends from the base of the skull to the level of the sixth cervical vertebra. And it serves both the respiratory and digestive systems by receiving air from the nasal cavity and air, food, and water from the oral cavity. Inferiorly, it opens into the larynx and esophagus. And the pharynx is divided into three regions according to the location. The first is the nasopharynx, the second is the oropharynx, and the third is the laryngopharynx. And the nasopharynx is the portion of the pharynx that is posterior to the nasal cavity and extends inferiorly to the ovula. So the oropharynx is the portion of the pharynx that is posterior to the oral cavity. And the most inferior portion of the pharynx is the laryngopharynx that extends from the hyoid bone down to the lower margin of the larynx. The upper part of the pharynx, or what we call as throat, lets only air pass through and lower parts permit air, foods, and fluids to pass. The pharyngeal, palatine, and lingual tonsils are located in the pharynx and they also called the Waldeyer's ring. So the ratromolar trigon is the small area behind the wisdom teeth. Now let's move on to larynx and trachea. So the larynx commonly called the voice box or glottis and it is the passageway of air between the larynx above and the trachea below. It also extends from the 4th to the 6th vertebral levels 
and the larynx is often divided into three sections which are the sublarynx, larynx, and the supralarynx. It is also formed by nine cartilages that are connected to each other by muscles and ligaments. The larynx plays an essential role in human speech and during sound production the vocal cords close together and vibrate as air expelled from the lungs passes between them. The false vocal cords have no role in sound production but they help close off the larynx when food is swallowed. The thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple and the epiglottis acts like a trap door to keep food and other particles from entering the larynx. Trachea, on the other hand, commonly called as the windpipe, is the main airway to the lungs and it divides into the right and left bronchi at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebra, channeling air into the right or left lung. And the hyaline cartilage in the tracheal wall provides support and keeps the trachea from collapsing the posterior soft tissue and allows for expansion of the esophagus which is immediately posterior to the trachea. The mucous membrane that lines the trachea is ciliated through the stratified columnar epithelium similar to that in the nasal cavity and nasopharynx. Goblet cells produce mucus that traps airborne particles and microorganisms and the cilia propel the mucus upward where it is either swallowed or expelled. And last among the components are the bronchi, bronchial tree, and the lungs. In the median sternum at the level of the fifth thoracic vertebra, the trachea divides into the right and the left primary bronchi, and the bronchi branch into smaller and smaller passageways until they terminate in tiny air sacs called alveoli. The cartilage and mucous membrane of the primary bronchi are similar to that in the trachea. And as the branching continues through the bronchial tree, the amount of hyaline cartilage in the walls decreases until it is absent in the smallest bronchioles. As the cartilage decreases, the amount of smooth muscle increases and the mucous membrane also undergoes a transition from ciliated to the stratified columnar epithelium to simple cuboidal epithelium to simple squamous epithelium. So the alveolar tracts and alveoli consist primarily of simple squamous epithelium which permits rapid diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide, exchange of gases between the air in the lungs and the blood in the capillaries occurs across the walls of the alveolar ducts and alveoli. The two lungs on the other hand which contain all the components of the bronchial tree beyond the primary bronchi occupy most of the space in the thoracic cavity and the lungs are soft and spongy because they are mostly air spaces surrounded by the alveolar cells and elastic connective tissue. They are also separated from each other by the mediastinum which contains the heart and the only point of attachment for each lung is the helum or root on the medial side. This is where the bronchi, blood vessels, lymphatics and nerve enter the lungs. The right lung is shorter, broader, and has greater volume than the left lung. It is divided into three lobes and each lobe is supplied by one of the secondary bronchi. The left lung is longer and narrower than the right lung and it has an indentation called the cardiac notch on its medial surface for apex of the heart. The left lung has two lobes and each lung is enclosed by double-layered serous membrane called the pleura. The visceral pleura is firmly attached to the surface of the lung at the helum. The visceral pleura is continuous with parietal pleura that lines the wall of the thorax. 
the small space between the visceral and parietal pleura is the pleural cavity and it contains a thin film of serous fluid that is produced by the pleura and the fluid acts as lubricant to reduce friction as the two layers slide against each other and it helps to hold the two layers together as the lungs inflate and deflate. Thank you.